Julius Evola was an Italian philosopher who lived from 1898 to 1974. His life was deeply affected by his experience serving as an artillery officer in World War I, and his intellectual path led him to become possibly the most traditionalist man who ever lived in the West. Evola has been described as the world's most right-wing thinker, and although framing him in the political axis strips him of a vast amount of complexity, it is an analysis that is certainly on the mark. In this video, we will condense Evola into a brief and digestible form, choosing a compilation of essays known as Metaphysics of War as the primary source. To understand Evola properly, it is essential to read his magnum opus, Revolt Against the Modern World. However, this book presents a daunting challenge to the modern mind, and with careful selection here, we will do our best to convey the essentials of his philosophy in a way that doesn't repulse a person unprepared for his severity. Evola is a man of action. In his metaphysics, action itself can have transcendent value regardless of the material contingencies in which it takes place. It is not the circumstances or even results of an action that give it value. Rather, it is the inspiration behind it, tied to the spiritual temperament of the performer from which it derives value. To demonstrate this, we can take an excerpt from Evola's essay, Soul and Race of War, in which he describes the various spiritual levels in which a person may partake in warfare. Quote, we have spoken of the superior Aryan conception of war and heroism as asceticism, catharsis, overcoming of the tie of the human eye, and ultimately, effective participation in immortality. Now, let us emphasize that the inferior is comprised in the superior, meaning, in our case, that the experience of combat according to this superior meaning must not be understood as a sort of confused mystical impulsiveness, but as the development, integration, and transfiguration of everything which can be experienced in war, or which can be asked of war, from any of the subordinate and conditioned standpoints. Proceeding from what is below to what is above, it can therefore be said that an unavoidable need for social justice in the international arena and a revolt against the hegemony of nations incarnating the civilization of the merchants may be the immediate determinant of the war. But the one who fights the war on such grounds can find in it also the occasion to realize, simultaneously, a higher experience, that is, fighting and being a hero, not so much as a soldier, but as a warrior, as a man who fights and loves to fight, not so much in the interest of material conquests as in the name of his king and of his tradition. And beyond this stage, in a successive phase, or a higher class, this same war can become a means to achieve war in the supreme sense, as asceticism and path of God, as culmination of that general meaning of living, of which it was said, vita est militia super terum. All this becomes integrated, and it can be added. There is no doubt that the impulse and the ability to sacrifice are superior by far in the one who realizes this supreme meaning in war, as compared one who stops at one of the subordinate meanings. And even on this mundane plane, the law of the earth can meet with the law of God, when the most tragic demands which can be made in the name of the greatness of a nation are fulfilled in an action whose ultimate sense is, however, the overcoming of the human tie, contempt for the petty existence of the plains, the tension which, in the supreme culminations of life, means choosing something which is more than life." End quote. Evola's metaphysics is not entirely focused on warfare, but warrior culture does play a key role in what Evola views as a properly functioning hierarchy. Warfare is referenced frequently due to its extreme nature. Action in extreme situations, in the inferior material plane, is one way in which a human may ascend to a higher spiritual plane. He briefly outlines his conception of a proper civilizational hierarchy, and the process by which it declines, in his essay, The Forms of Warlike Heroism. Quote, Since we are not talking about just any old hierarchy, but about true hierarchy, which means that what is above and rules is really what is superior, it is necessary to refer to systems of civilization in which, at the center, there is a spiritual elite, and the ways of life of the slaves, the bourgeois, and the warriors derive their ultimate meaning and supreme justification from reference to the principle which is the specific heritage of this spiritual elite, and manifest this principle in their material activity. 
However, an abnormal state is arrived at if the center shifts so that the fundamental point of reference, instead of being the spiritual principle, is that of the servile caste, the bourgeoisie, or the warriors. Each of these castes manifests its own hierarchy and a certain code of cooperation, but each is more unnatural, more distorted, and more subversive than the last, until the process reaches its limit. That is, a system in which the vision of life characteristic of the slaves comes to orientate everything, and to imbue itself with all the surviving elements of social wholeness. Politically, this involutionary process is quite visible in Western history, and it can be traced through into the most recent times. States of the aristocratic and sacred type have been succeeded by monarchical warrior states, to a large extent already secularized, which in turn have been replaced by states ruled by capitalist oligarchies bourgeois or merchant caste, and finally we have witnessed tendencies towards socialist, collectivist, and proletarian states, which have culminated in Russian Bolshevism, the caste of the slaves. This process is paralleled by transitions from one type of civilization to another, from one fundamental meaning of life to another. In each phase, every concept, every principle, every institution assumes a different meaning, reflecting the worldview of the predominant caste. This is also true of war, and thus we can approach the task we originally set ourselves, of specifying the varieties of meaning which battle and heroic death can acquire. War has a different face, in accordance with its being placed under the sign of one or another of the castes. While in the cycle of the first caste, war was justified by spiritual motives, and showed clearly its value as a path to supernatural accomplishment and the attainment of immortality by the hero, this being the motive of the holy war. In the cycle of the warrior aristocracies, they fought for the honor and power of some particular prince, to whom they showed a loyalty which was willingly associated with the pleasure of war for war's sake. With the passage of power into the hands of the bourgeoisie, there was a deep transformation. At this point, the concept of the nation materializes and democratizes itself, and an anti-aristocratic and naturalistic conception of the homeland is formed, so that the warrior is replaced by the soldier-citizen, who fights simply for the defense or the conquest of land. Wars, however, generally remain slyly driven by supremacist motives or tendencies originating within the economic and industrial order. Finally, the last stage, in which leadership passes into the hands of the slaves, has already been able to realize, in Bolshevism, another meaning of war, which finds expression in the following characteristic words of Lenin, quote, the war between nations is a childish game, preoccupied by the survival of a middle class which does not concern us. True war, our war, is the world revolution for the destruction of the bourgeoisie and the triumph of the proletariat." End quote. Given all this, it is obvious that the term hero is a common denominator which embraces very different types and meanings. The readiness to die, to sacrifice one's own life, may be the sole prerequisite from the technical and collectivist point of view, but also from the point of view of what today, rather brutally, has come to be referred to as cannon fodder. However, it is also obvious that it is not from this point of view that war can claim any real spiritual value as regards the individual. Once the latter does not appear as fodder, but as personality, as is the Roman standpoint, this latter standpoint is only possible provided that there is a double relationship of means to ends. That is to say, when on the one hand, the individual appears as a means with respect to a war and its material ends, but simultaneously, when a war in its turn is a means for the individual, as an opportunity or path for the end of his spiritual accomplishment, favored by heroic experience. There is then a synthesis, an energy, and, with it, an utmost efficiency. End quote. Here we come across Evola's concept of involution. As opposed to a positively evolving progress, Evola believes in a devolutionary process of decline and collapse. The center of civilization descends down, from the highest spiritual level, into the warrior caste. Most historical European civilizations were of this type. In Evola's time, civilization had descended even further into the mercantile caste, and during the Great War, the armies of the Allies and Central Powers alike were composed of conscripted citizens who served merely as soldiers rather than warriors. 
he identified Bolshevist Russia as of the lowest type, that in which civilization descended into the hands of the masses. He essentially had the same view of America, and now all of Western civilization would be considered by him to be in the hands of the slave caste. It is important to understand that the warrior is not at the pinnacle of Evola's hierarchy. Rather, it is the priestly caste which directs material endeavors towards a higher spiritual aim. Without this caste, the warrior caste, left to its own devices, may go through the motions of combat, but it will be war for war's sake. War does not have a value due to its material purpose. Rather, it is the act of engaging in warfare as such that has value, both to an individual being and human collectives. Warfare is a means by which human beings can ascend, spiritually, to a higher plane, either through a sort of ego death or actual death. We can examine this concept further by reading from Evola's essay, Race and War, the Aryan Conception of Combat. Quote, let us come now to a pure metaphysical exposition of the doctrine in question. We find it in a text originating from the ancient Indo-Aryan races, imprinted with a sense of the heroic spiritual reality, which it would be hard to match elsewhere. It is the Bhagavad Gita, a part of the epic poem, the Mahabharata, which to an expert eye contains precious material relating not only to the spirituality of the Aryan races which migrated to Asia, but to that of the Hyperborean nucleus of these, which, according to the traditional views to which our conception of race refers, must be considered as the origin of them all. The Bhagavad Gita contains in the shape of a dialogue the doctrine given by the incarnate divinity Krishna to a warrior prince Arjuna, who had invoked him as, overcome by humanitarian and sentimentalist scruples, he found himself no longer able to resolve to fight the enemy. The judgment of the god is categorical. It defines the mercy which had withheld Arjuna from fighting as, Quote, degrading impotence, end quote, and quote, impurities not at all befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets, but to infamy, end quote. Therefore, it is not on the basis of earthly and contingent necessities, but of a divine judgment that the duty of combat is confirmed here. The promise is, quote, either you will be killed on the battlefield and attain the heavenly planets, or you will conquer and enjoy the earthly kingdom. Therefore, get up with determination and fight." End quote. The inner guideline, necessary to transfigure the lesser war into greater holy war, in death and triumphant resurrection, and to make contact through heroic experience with the transcendental root of one's own being, is clearly stated by Krishna. Quote, Therefore, O Arjuna, surrendering all your works unto me, with full knowledge of me, without desires for profit, with no claims to proprietorship, and free from lethargy, fight. End quote. The terms are just as clear about the purity of heroic action, which must be wanted for itself, beyond every contingent motivation, every passion, and all gross utility. The words of the text are, quote, do thou fight for the sake of fighting, without considering happiness or distress, loss or gain, victory or defeat? And by so doing, you shall never incur sin." End quote. But beyond even this, a true metaphysical justification of war is arrived at. We will try to express this in the most accessible way. The text works on the fundamental distinction between what in man exists in the supreme sense, and as such, is incorruptible and immutable spirit, and the corporeal and the human element, which has only an illusory existence. Having stressed the metaphysical non-reality of what one can lose or make another lose in the vicissitudes of combat as ephemeral life and mortal body, there is nothing painful and tragic, it is said, in the fact that what is fatally destined to fall, falls. That aspect of the divine which appears as an absolute and sweeping force is recalled. Before the greatness of this force, which flashes through Arjuna's mind in the moment of a supernatural vision, every created, that is, conditioned existence, appears as a negation. It can therefore be said that such a force strikes as a terrible revelation wherever such negation is actively denied. That is to say, in more concrete and intelligible terms, Wherever a sudden outburst sweeps up every finite life, every limitation of the petty individual, either to destroy him or to revive him. Moreover, the secret of the becoming of the fundamental restlessness and perpetual change which characterizes life here below is deduced precisely from the situation of beings, finite in themselves, which also participate in something infinite. 
The beings which would be described as created by Christian terminology are described rather according to ancient Aryan tradition as conditioned, subject to becoming, change and disappearance, precisely because in them a power burns which transcends them, which wants something infinitely vaster than all that they can ever want. Once the text, in various ways, has given the sense of such a vision of life, it goes on to specify what fighting and heroic experience must mean for the warrior. Values change, a higher life manifests itself through death, and destruction, for the one who overcomes it, is a liberation. It is precisely in its most frightening aspects that the heroic outburst appears as a sort of manifestation of the divine in its capacity of metaphysical force of destruction of the finite. In the jargon of some modern philosophers, this would be called the negation of the negation. The warrior who smashes degrading impotence, who faces the vicissitudes of heroism, with your mind absorbed in the supreme spirit, seizing upon a plan according to which both the I and the thou, and therefore both fear for oneself and mercy for others, lose all meaning, can be said to assume actively the absolute divine force, to transfigure himself within it, and to free himself by breaking through the limitations relating to the mere human state of existence. Quote, Life like a bow, the mind like the arrow, the target to pierce, the supreme spirit, to join mind to spirit, as the shot arrow hits its target, end quote. These are the evocative expressions contained in another text of the same tradition, the Markandeya Purana. Such, in short, is the metaphysical justification of war, the sacred interpretation of heroism, the transformation of the lesser war into the greater holy war, according to the ancient Indo-Aryan tradition, which gives us, therefore, in the most complete and direct form, the intimate content present, also in the other formulations pointed out." End quote. Here we should notice that Arjuna's concerns are not addressed in relation to other beings or his own physical well-being. Instead, warfare is justified purely by the paths it offers to higher spiritual development. It has nothing to do with concern over the lives of others or even one's own life. It is the possibilities of action that place warfare in a unique domain of human activities. The cost in blood of this experience is not a deterrent, but rather that which elevates it. The cessation of a life that is doomed to end is not tragic. All life comes to an end, and it is how one dies that sets the final alignment of one's being. Here we enter into the more esoteric domain of Evola's philosophy. He speaks of being and becoming, and the negation of the negation. Being and becoming are dualistic philosophical concepts where being is the pure form of something and becoming is a temporary fragment of that being. One might also use the term mere appearance to describe this becoming, whereas being is the thing in itself. When the mere appearance of material life is the centerpiece of existence, this is a negation of the true form, the essential being of a person, the absolute person, as Evola would put it. By participating in warfare with the aim of uniting oneself, with one's absolute self, with one's becoming offered as a sacrifice, one negates the becoming and thus negates the negation. It is important to note here that the sacrifice itself is not the negation. This is still constraining oneself to material thinking. As Krishna says, it is the complete lack of concern for the material self that is the negation. One may achieve the same ascension regardless of whether or not this material existence is taken away. The material is of no concern at all. It is only the higher achievements that matter. Not everyone is capable of achieving this highest tier of action. In Evola's philosophy, you are either a person with this traditional aristocratic soul, or you aren't. Evola presents a guidebook for those who are already of this differentiated type to act out a traditional way of being. Attempting this traditional action is not a matter of fundamentally altering one's being, but more of a discovery of the soul. Every person has pre-established potential, not in the biological sense, but in the spiritual sense. And a person may act out their potential or not, but in no way can it be changed. This is an ultimate rejection of egalitarianism, and we should note here as well that Evola's conception of hierarchy is most analogous to the Hindu caste system. In a traditional civilization, the proper structure has four essential layers. In short, the priestly caste, the warrior caste, the mercantile caste, and the worker caste. The proper action in this traditional hierarchy is not to climb it, but to perfectly perform one's pre-established role in it. 
A traditional civilization can only function when each caste properly performs and desires to perform its specific duties. All are essential, if not equal. Therefore, all persons may be able to act out a traditional way of being, regardless of their position in the hierarchy. Those who are of the mercantile spirit should perform their economic function and love doing so for the sake of properly aiming their civilization upwards. The other castes should do the same. Together, all are aimed upwards toward the same superior point, each layer providing guidance to those who are beneath them. A critical point to note here is that the warrior class is traditionally the ruling class. The warrior class is not a soldier class, it is an aristocratic class. A proper aristocrat is not the modern mercantile type of elite, nor is he merely a soldier. The warrior is a spiritual elite, who thus leads his civilization and conducts and participates in warfare on behalf of it. Even in modernity, a semblance of this was seen in the world wars, in which the sons of politicians fought and died, despite their wealth and prestige providing them a means of avoiding the conflict. Building on this note, the warriors rule, and yet the priests are above them. The warriors are the highest terrestrial caste, but the priests are concerned with matters on a higher plane. It is the role of priests to give spiritual direction to their civilization. Priests do not sully themselves with concern over the mundane matters of the state. They provide guidance to the warriors, and the warriors in turn act in accordance with the soul of their people. When the priests rule, the civilization is already corrupted, and when the warriors usurp the priests, it is the same. This note should reinforce to you that the traditional civilization functions primarily through acts of will and not of coercion. While force is necessary in its maintenance, fundamentally the warriors must desire to follow the priests, and the priests in turn must not desire to seize material profit, but to always act with respect to their religion. If the priests force the warriors to action, then all is already lost, and the same is true for the other castes on a large scale. Traditional civilization can be thought of as an act of collective will. It can only exist when a people desires it to exist. Here we can reach a conclusion with advice to the listener. To the modern reader, what matters most about Evola is not so much his particular metaphysical beliefs, but the general attitude towards life that he offers. You don't have to specifically believe what Evola believes in order to extract value from it. Evola provides you with a different way of thinking that is far removed from modernity. Even if you haven't read Evola, with this video you should at least now understand enough about Evolian thought to effectively interact with it. If you are interested in learning more and want more video content as opposed to reading, there are several options on YouTube. Arctos, the publisher of many English translations of Evola, has a few podcasts on him, and of course you can buy audiobooks from Arctos as well. Morgoth's Review did a video on Evola recently, and Philosophy Cat has an ongoing series on Revolt Against the Modern World, Evola's quintessential work. Additionally, I found a very small channel named Kali Yuga that seems to be doing a similar series. All of these will be linked in the description. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.